All right, welcome back to another hour of Scotch Hour. My name is Noah. And my name is Jesse. All right, Jesse, so uh, another week has gone by, um, and we have another uh, beautiful uh, lady of the night here um, on the docket for us, and what is that? All right, this week we have got the Dalmore 12 Highland Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. Ooh, that sounds pretty good. I love the I love the label on there. I love that. How is that a deer or is that what is that? <laughs> Definitely a stag. Yes. A stag. Okay. <laughs> All right. I love that. I love how it's uh, big and silver right there right on the bottle. So, uh, what what do you what do we know about this bottle here tonight? Well, a couple things uh, about the Dalmore is that it is aged in American white ex bourbon casks before half half <laughs> half is transferred to. Ex Oloroso Sherry casks. Ex Roloso. Oloroso. 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 Okay. So that's one of the things Dalmore is known for, actually, are their sherry casks, the aging in that specific cask. Okay, so they take it from American Oak, they age it in that first, and then they move it over. Only half of it. Only half. Okay. Half. All right. Well, let's uh, pop this a bottle open. Okay. And see what the nose is like on this one. Nice. Made it in the cup. This is always a good start. Yeah. Shooting. Uh, we're batting a thousand here. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> you did miss one night. <laughs> All right. Definitely in the 900s, probably, but not a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, this is a little bit darker than the last couple. Yes, definitely more of that deep orange. Yeah, it definitely has a lot, a lot more of a golden orange type of color. But the other ones were a little bit lighter. Definitely get a small scent of that sherry smell. Yes. Um, I was going to say like a hint of uh, maybe like... Um, Maybe caramelized orange or something like that. Like like it's like a subtle orange. Very common. A little bit of vanilla. Yeah, a bit of vanilla. All right, I'm making a taste this one. I'm okay. diving in. Very nice smooth finish. Very nice bold body. Definitely, I'm getting a lot more of that. I'm getting like, a, I don't want to say mulled wine, but definitely kind of like that Christmassy orange. Spice. Spice, yeah. Hmm. Not very, it's not very hot, so you can tell it's been aged. Mm -hmm. Hints of uh, coffee or cocoa. Definitely a good scotch to go with your tiramisu. Yeah, I like this one. I think uh, a mild cigar, though. Definitely a mild cigar. Don't want to ruin this flavor. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> you know, um, I've been talking to you about uh, another uh, another person who wants to come on our show, right? Yes. So, uh, Brian... Um, he, uh, he's originally from, from Michigan. I and did not know that about Brian. Oh, you didn't know that? I oh did yeah. Not. So yeah, he's originally from Michigan. He's not from Colorado like us. Um, but, uh, he, uh, he was joking around like, uh, I guess during like one Christmas, there's like this Detroit band and they're like a seventies band. So they have some like pretty uh, strange lyrics and Apparently one Christmas he was joking around like doing like a poetry hour, just like reading the lyrics, like if he was reading poetry. So I told him like he has to come on our show and do that. All right. And not uh, for an hour though. Not, no, 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 <laughs> not, not for an hour, but you can join us for an hour. But, uh, you know, talking about uh, like some of these Christmas notes and stuff like that, that just kind of reminded me of, uh, of that and like having a mild cigar. Cause like when I was in college, uh, our fraternity had a like poetry night where we would read poetry and smoke cigars and drink scotch. 
So that kind of just, uh, that, that brought that up there. That's great. I have got to say, I am a fan of uh, this scotch, the white American oak ex-bourbon mm-hmm. casks and the sherry delightful flavor. I love this body and the finish. This goes down way too easy. Way too easy. Okay, folks. So that means if we're like, like uh, mumbling at the end and slurring our words, you know why. Yeah. That's what yeah. that means. It's the, the finish is full of flavor, but still buttery. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, this is a lot more quaffable than the last <laughs> couple. Good word. Yeah, isn't it? I usually use quaffable when I'm talking about wines, but uh, this is a very good scotch. All right. Hey, let's jump in. Jump in. So we've had some fails in our past episodes around our challenges. Did Uh, you meet the challenge? I (laughs) met the challenge. Yes. I can watch a movie. All right. Watching movies are easy. (laughs) Especially good movies. Especially good movies. All right. I as well met my own (laughs) challenge. (laughs) So we were both victorious. Hey, uh, we are two for two in the last two weeks. We did it last week and we did this week. That's right. That's outstanding. So what did you think? Romeo and Juliet, 1996, the big screen movie. Well, first of all, Romeo and Juliet, the 1996 version with Leonardo DiCaprio. It's definitely like in my top ten movies. I've always loved that movie. All right, that um, is amazing. Uh, I like. Uh, I'm not like a huge, huge fan of reading Shakespeare, but I do like um, watching um, adaptations uh, that are closer to like modern era. So like uh, this uh, version of Romeo and Juliet is really awesome. The one that we talked about um, uh, um, was it last week or the week before? Maybe two weeks ago. With Patrick Stewart. Yes. Um, I forget which one that one was, but that had to do like more with like a World War II. Macbeth, yes. Macbeth, yeah. So um, this one, though, I thought was really awesome. I love the cinematography with it. I love how like uh, the director speeds uh, some scenes up, slows it down, some other scenes. Uh, keeping that, uh, what was that? Uh, pin, uh, the I was it pentam uh, pentameter yeah the pentameter <laughs> keeping that <laughs> keeping that flow going, but at the same time by using it, like how the speed goes uh, slow and fast and the facial expressions of the actors you, it gets a, it gives like a little bit of comedy along with like the seriousness of the tragedy of the of the of the story. So and then I one of the things I really really loved about it I mean at first I thought it was done uh, filmed with it. Uh, Rona Beach there in California, and that's where I assume that that it took place, which I think that's where they say it takes place. Um, and obviously it wasn't filmed there, um, but I'll let you break that one if you want. Um, Mexico City, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was filmed in Mexico City. Um, but one of the things I really, really enjoyed about it was uh, the the guns. Yes, absolutely. I, I, thought, I thought it was really neat how they used guns as like the long, like a rifle as a long sword, and then like a, like a nine millimeter as a dagger, and so on and so forth. I, I really enjoyed this a- adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. I agree full heartedly. I I don't know that this movie's in my top ten, but oh, it's definitely you know, in my top thirty. I should probably throw this up here for people can see it. I'll keep talking. So yeah. Leonardo DiCaprio. Amazing actor, uh, you know. I, I know we probably made more money on the Titanic, but guess what? That ship sank. Was crap. <laughs> <laughs> this role was amazingly performed by himself. Claire Danes did a wonderful. You know, and, and the thing is, like, I don't know. Did you think Claire Danes? Like, I never thought Claire Danes was ever all that hot. I don't. I didn't. But she plays Juliet fabulously. Opposite I think she, Leonardo. Uh, I think she did a great job. Apparently, there's a whole lot. There was a whole lot of chemistry at the time, but people thought that they didn't like each other because they didn't know how to react to each other because of that chemistry that they had. Uh, she was like only 17 at the time, and he was 21. And a few years different. A few years difference, but you, I, you know, you'd have to say it. There's a when your very first scene, and you don't know the other person at all. Your very first scene is in bed and partially nude type of thing. I can see how you would not know how to react with that coworker, I guess. 
Yeah, I've never had that opportunity, so <laughs> I'll let you I know mean, if I ever do. <laughs> I never had that opportunity either, but I would imagine. I'm thinking makes, it might be great. <laughs> <laughs> it could be great, but when you have a bunch of people watching you, it could yeah, cause. Yeah, I'm so, out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I can, I can understand why they might have like seemed like they were cold to each other. Because of that whole scenario, you know, I think it'd be kind of weird. And plus the fact that he was 21, she's still 17. So that's not quite legal. I mean, you know, definitely some boundaries there we won't get but, into. Uh, <laughs> but it's definitely better than what the other option was. Natalie Portman. Now, I do think Natalie Portman would have done a great job. But um, being that she was uh, 13 when they are going to film that movie and he was and Leonardo DiCaprio was 21. I, I think that would have been pushing the envelope a little bit too much. So I do think it was a good idea that they went with somebody who was older. Absolutely. I will, though, say, man, her role in The Professional, her well role. done. Yeah. <laughs> Natalie Portman, I think Natalie Portman's a great actress. I think she has some really good movies out there. Absolutely. So Claire Danes, not necessarily super attractive to either of us, but absolutely perfect for the role of Juliet, John yep. Lugazamo. John Lucas almost did. Oh an awesome my job. goodness! Oh my god! <laughs> he like his character. The way he played his character was phenomenal. Yes, it was. Um, and then you know I didn't catch this all those years ago because he's done so much more since then. But do you remember who the character was? The actor was that her family was trying to court her upon. So you're talking about Paris? <laughs> yes, Paris. Who is who happens to be Prince Paris? Right? Yes. And uh, I did not know who it was until you told me, which is uh, Paul Rudd. That w blew my mind. <laughs> yeah, that totally blew my mind. I did not even recognize Paul Rudd whatsoever. When we Plus, talk he is actually like really kind of serious in this movie. Yeah. Where he's normally like a comedian. Yes. Um, let's jump right to that just for a moment. We talked very briefly beforehand. You mentioned during the... Uh, love struck scene um, where later Leonardo finds out his dear Juliet for the first time is a is Capulet. That the, yeah. Is that the elevator scene, the kiss and all that stuff? Yes. The elevator scene, the kiss, they're all running around at the party. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the costumes were intended for a purpose. Um, will you elaborate on that? Yeah. So apparently from everything I've been reading and stuff about this movie, uh, the director or the designer, uh, the costume design person, they wanted, during that uh, party scene, they wanted each costume to reflect that character's traits. So Romeo was the knight in shining armor. Juliet was the uh, angel. Juliet's father was um, was Caesar, because he wanted he's like an emperor. Uh, her mom was Cleopatra. Um, uh, Mercur how do you say Mercutio. 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 Yeah, I, I don't, I still don't get his character. He's like dressed up as a girl, so I have no idea. I don't know how that really relates, but uh, maybe it does. But Paul Rudd was dressed up as an astronaut. As an astronaut. Yeah, I don't get that one either. <laughs> I'm not sure how that that, that fits his traits uh, or traits of uh, Prince Paris, but um, I, I just I thought it, it, I can't unsee it. It's literally frozen <laughs> in my head. First of all, the fact that that was Paul Rudd after all these years. I didn't know who he, who he was in 1996. I believe you and I actually went to the theater and saw this movie in 1996. Yeah, that, you're dating us, man. <laughs> try, try not to date us. We don't want people to know how old we are. But uh, uh, nonetheless, man. I've gone to long measures. So people don't know how old I am. Okay? Stop is dating it, me. Man. Is it the Botox? <laughs> <laughs> But Paul Rudd is an astronaut. I, I loved it. Um, and how fitting that later on he's the Ant-Man um, going through a different sort of space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quantum space. That's right. So um, talking about quantum theory, you know, this is like, well, yeah, but sorry, sorry. Didn't mean sidetrack this. And Mercutio, Harold Perushin. I can't pronounce I, I his know name. He, I know. <laughs> I was told that he was on Oz, and apparently he did a, a phenomenal job on Oz. It, you know what he did a phenomenal job on was this movie as Romeo's best friend. Oh, man. Uh, the guy literally dies for him yep. in the film, in the book, in the play. Yep. And it was, again, beautifully played. Definitely. You know, all the acting in that movie was top notch. It really was. Yeah. Like, the acting was on point throughout that whole movie. Yeah, um, it was just amazing. And then to your point, costumes. 
a big win. Oh yeah, uh, the costumes, the guns, as the long swords, <laughs> the whole adaptation of the whole movie was phenomenal. How about the chariots as those old square cars? Again, oh, yeah. wonderfully done, yeah, spinning wonderful. around. Talking about that type of stuff, apparently every sign that you see in that movie is related to Shakespeare, uh, other other plays and stuff like that. So it's all related. And I only caught one until you mentioned that I will rewatch it and I will look for them. Um, the director here, Boz Lerman. Good job. Yeah. Great job. He did a phenomenal job. Um, well done movie again. I don't, oh, did you hear about this though, about that movie too? That the, the hairdresser <laughs> <laughs> was kidnapped. <laughs> I had not heard and, about and that. And Lerman, Lerman had to pay three thousand dollars to get the hairdresser back. <laughs> That's tragic, but Mexico City might have its risks in 1996. There were a few drug cartels going well, around. About st- I think they still have their risks. We talking about just back then? Yeah, but you know, bring enough money, you can apparently buy anyone. Apparently so. And then the other odd thing I thought was really weird is from the moment that the. Um, the TV announcer comes on at the very beginning of the movie. It says that there, uh, it says something about like a two hour, two hour, two hour traffic jam yes. or two hour traffic. And the movie is exactly two hours. Well done. Yeah. I think that, I think that's amazing how uh, they had that foresight to like have the announcer come in and do kind of like the, like the setup of Romeo and Juliet talking about two hours and it ends in two hours. I think, uh, from start to finish, I think that's uh, that's kind of phenomenal how they fit that all in there. All right. Now, summing it up, do you have a favorite scene? Uh, you know, hmm. Honest, honestly, I think one, like, I have a couple of scenes I really enjoyed a lot. Like, I think the beginning scene when you have the Capulet, boys versus the Montague boys the gas station at the gas station yes. I think that scene when you first see uh, John uh, Lugazamo Lugazamo when we first see him I think that scene is like really awesome it is and then I think there's like a later scene the, uh, that, that scene makes me want those cowboy boots with the steel heel <laughs> just put out that match after I light my cigarette <laughs> yeah right <laughs> and I think the other scene that's really good too is um is uh, the bat, uh, the scene where um, uh, Romeo's best friend dies? Ooh, okay, so that's actually going to be my number one. Where okay, Tibalt, that's probably my number two, but yeah, Tibalt kills yeah. Mercutio, yeah. and Mercutio, uh, pr- you know, brings a plague upon both the houses. Uh, I I think it's so well done. The entire scene beautifully played. The emotions and acting uh superb i don't know what else to say you know there's lots of great scenes uh there's a ton of great scenes in that movie yeah romeo and supposedly like the um the scene where where romeo and juliet first meet there at the uh running around at the party well not well they were running around the party but i'm talking (laughs) about like when they meet at the uh at the aquarium yes um they, that part there, apparently they had a really hard time with that scene. So they had to turn off all the lights and they used lights in the uh, in the aquarium, at the top of the aquarium and the bottom of the aquarium. So that way there was no reflection off the glass. That makes perfect sense. But apparently like one of the more famous scenes from that movie is the elevator scene. Which oh, and that's my second favorite. And it's that whole surrounding, um, again, that's where you find help. Let's not mention Paul that. Paul Rudd's apparently a spaceman. <laughs> Well, and you, maybe it might make sense since uh, Romeo was like high on drugs at that home party. Yeah, no joke. Um, but it is, you know, that scene, it makes me remember how great it feels, not drugs, but <laughs> how great it feels to be in love, be, you know, ha- be fancy free, to have zero worries in the world where you're just chasing wow. a piece of tail, so to speak. <laughs> And running around having fun. Fancy free, you know, I think really last time I really felt fancy free without anything to worry about was probably college. 
Uh, I, I've definitely felt it more recently than that, but it's different at, in many ways. And I don't know that life should be fancy free. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds dangerous. Um, but what a great feeling. And, and I got that feeling. I experienced that with the way that the film in that scene, um, in those scenes was directed and filmed um, and the way the actors played their roles. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I agree. I have nothing really more to say about that movie that that it's phenomenal. Oh, I do actually have one more thing to say. If you are in college or in high school or junior <laughs> high, Where right, are you going? <laughs> and uh, you decide you want to watch this movie, it's a great adaptation of of uh, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Just be aware that it does not follow Shakespeare one hundred percent. They do switch around some characters. They eliminated a couple of characters. So just be aware of that when you watch the movie. Do not use it as a as a book report because then your your professor or teacher will smell you out. That that's where I was that was my last I think you're absolutely right. Um Friar Lawrence's role is one of the most accurate <laughs> throughout the movie. Um but lots of variations otherwise. Still, um I'm uh, happy to hear it's in your top 10 movies. I'm really going to have to reconsider where exactly I want to reconsider where exactly it falls in my movie list because a lot has changed in the last couple of years, um, even with COVID. And you know, another uh, top 10 movie of mine is A Night's Tale. A Night's Tale is a phenomenal movie. Why, though, the tragedy <laughs> with Heath Ledger? <laughs> <laughs> Great movie. I agree. Yeah. Um, I think we can go into Heath Ledger in a different show, or maybe yes. we can do it here. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. But um, I think the tragedy probably has to do more with maybe playing the Joker and some personal aspects in his life. Because um, even Jack Nicholson said when he played the Joker that uh, it's a very kind of, I'm not exactly what his wording was, but he told, he like gave Ledger some advice not to like go deep into Joker because it's, it's uh, it's kind of hard to come back from it. And as a method actor, Heath Ledger absolutely struggled with taking that advice. Yeah, exactly. But um, but I will say A Knight's Tale for multiple reasons. That is probably in my top five. Really? Okay. Um, again, I'm gonna go not top ten, maybe top thirty. But ten things I hate about you, also with Heath Ledger and Julia Stiles. That might be in my it top It was 15. a fun movie, but I'm not even sure if that would make my top 50. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll revisit Heath Ledger. Maybe uh, our future challenge is in the works with that okay. one there. So since we are kind of revisiting um, last week's podcast, I do want to bring this up. Okay. Uh, cryptocurrencies. Yes. Oh, Lord. The oh, morning Lord. after, I looked at the news, Noah, and I was like, damn, he was right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to re-update uh, this at the time of recording. And the reason why I want to do that is that um, if anyone who's followed me on Facebook, right, they know I've been talking about XRP for a long time. There's a lot of reasons why I think XRP is better than Bitcoin which I did mention last week uh, for a couple of reasons. One, most the majority of the uh, Bitcoin miners are in China. A lot of them are at risk to the Three Gorges Dam. So if that dam does break, um, that's going to cause a whole lot of issues. Also, when you look at um, Bitcoin mining, it's very um, it consumes a lot of energy. So if you're an environmentalist type of person or a green person. Bitcoin is obviously a really bad thing because of how much energy it uses to mine. So um, taking all that into consideration, I've, um, and then there's really no, no real usage. They don't really use Bitcoin for anything. They just, just because it's the first thing out there, they call it digital gold, but it's really not. It's still way up there though. It's well, yeah. I mean, so it has a, the biggest uh, market share. Um, but so I think you have to look for coins that have some kind of utility to them. XRP already has utility uh, for cross-border um, payments. And so when we look at that, if you've been following me on Facebook, I was sharing stuff about XRP when it was about 22 to 24 cents, somewhere right around there. And if you look at it today, right just now. It's true, I know. It's $1.42 a uh, coin. So you would have probably made a decent 
you know, almost a six decent or seven chunk. times your money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, so I, I'm not really trying to like rub in anything here. I'm just, just saying like, for those of you who are looking into a cryptocurrency, um, do it responsibly, right? Never, never invest more than what you can afford. Uh, but definitely, um, look for something that has some kind of utility to it. And, um, right now the market's still very young. We're still in pretty much the beginning stages of the altcoin season. So we haven't really hit the tip top of the market yet. So if you feel like, uh, it's too late to, uh, to jump in, there's still time to jump in especially since a lot of people believe that uh, XRP is going to be the new global reserve coin. If that is the case, that means the value of XRP will go up to $10,000 or more a coin. So paying a dollar 40 a coin. And if it goes up to $10,000, eventually like three, four or five years down the line, uh, still probably pretty much worth it. I'm not like, I'm not giving you financial advice. I'm just saying this is just my personal opinion. So I just wanted to share that just for those of you guys who wanted a kind of an update. Um, also, we talked about the economy a little yes, bit. Yes, we did. So what were you saying about the economy that has you worried? Oh, you know, what has me worried about this economy is that we're talking about all over the news how we need to send out stimulus checks and everyone's poor and the economy is doing terrible, yet a, the stock market continues to go up. Businesses continue to thrive. And what kind of business is it? Because it seems like small businesses are dying out. Yeah, the small businesses absolutely have died out, but they've also been shut down. Um, you know, Casa Bonita's filed Chapter 11 uh, because, you know, who's ordering if you're, not from Colorado, <laughs> if you're not from Colorado, <laughs> you have, uh, if, they, if they don't shut down Casa Bonita forever, you have to go there at least once. Yes, you if will. If you are from Colorado, you know, never to go there again. Run to Casa <laughs> Bonita to get the runs, just saying. It's, uh, hey, I, I will give them this. They have good sopapillas. They do have good sopapillas. And when the divers are there, it's a fun experience, but the food is less than great. The reason... Whatever. Do you call that food? Like, <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> like, it's like going through like the cafeteria, like when you're in like grade school or something, going oh, down the line. that food is better than this, man. Oh, no. <laughs> Casa Bonita is not as good as the grade school food these days. These kids are treated. Remember high school? We lived the dream in high school. We're like, do we want McDonald's or Taco Bell? What well, day is it? Oh, nice Pizza Hut. Like when we went to high school, right? I think we were one of the few schools that had open campus in Colorado. Yes, we did. So it was kind of nice that we could leave and go wherever we wanted. Armando's! Yes. Uh, so was, we left. Yeah, uh, there, that location yeah. is no longer there, but they do the, have the other pizza locations. The right there by 7-Eleven, uh -huh. right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Delicious. We should revisit them in one of their other locations since that one did close. Do they have another location? Yeah, it's right down over, uh, down Parker Road in Parker. Oh, dang. Yeah, we gotta go, we gotta go visit that one just for all time's sakes. Armando, send us a coupon. <laughs> <laughs> Armando, if you're listening or if anyone knows anybody that works at Armando's, give us a discount, man. Hook, yeah. hook, hook a brother up. Hook us up. <laughs> <laughs> we miss you. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, for all time's sake. High school was great for us. Um, Romeo and Juliet was great. You know, that, uh, yeah, XRP, you, you have me. For the first time on the fence, I'm usually like way out here and you have me for the first time on the fence and I'm thinking, are you considering buying crypto I'm now? I'm literally considering buying some crypto. You need uh, to buy some kind of crypto. Man, I, I probably but do. Whatever you do, like, like I said, don't put more than you can afford to lose. Uh, make sure it's utility based. Do your research. Um, I mean, I can give you advice, but I don't really want to tell you what to buy because yeah. If, if it I happens, know where to find you? <laughs> no, the thing is, like, if if I tell you, like, hey, buy this or buy this or buy this, and it does bad, I don't want you to blame me. Uh, so, I mean, I'll give you some hints of where to look. I know it's a risk, and I'm not a gambler. You're much better at that than I. Am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the other thing I've been doing, um, and I think everyone should be doing this if you're if you're worried or concerned about the economy, which is really right now being propped up by all this uh, all must, this fake money. Yeah, they must be just printing money and giving it away because... Well, but you think it's like, that's what they did, right? Like anytime you keep like, uh, you have interest rates being artificially low, they're propping up the economy. Uh, when they did quantitative easing, they're propping up the economy. Um, and when they're doing that, all they're doing is just printing up more and more money and it's uh, making the value of the dollar go down, down, and down. So... 
Uh, even though it seems like uh, those of us who are, are getting these uh, stimulus checks, yeah, it seems great or whatever when we get them. But honestly, you have to look further than just your pocketbook when you first get the check or whatever. Uh, you have to look probably like a year, two, three down the line and understand that what's happening right now is we're looking at a total collapse of our economy, hyperinflation, those types of things. So you have to start preparing for what's going to happen. And if you're listening to the Davos group, the World Economic Forum, um, the IMF and stuff like that, you know they've all been talking about a great reset. And then uh, you look, start listening to the central banks are talking about um, central bank digital coins, CBDCs. So you know if they're all talking about it, it's on the horizon and it's probably coming quicker than most people think. So you have to start making some kind of moves to hedge against the, uh, the inevitable collapse that's going to be coming. So whether that be in crypto or maybe investing in some precious metals, whether it be gold and silver, silver right now is still very affordable, uh, about 30 cents uh, an ounce. Um, so that could be something to look at as well. Um, silver bullet. Yeah, silver bullet. <laughs> like, and it's funny, too, because you can actually buy a silver bullet. Like, They actually have silver bullets there for sale at some of these uh, places. If I'm buying silver, it's in the shape of a bullet. <laughs> I'm more worried about the wolf man right now. <laughs> so I'm just saying, like, if, if you're worried about the economy, you're worried about the, uh, the collapse, because if you really ask me, right, and I know, like, I know we don't try to get too political on here, but if you ask me what we're living through right now is very similar to Weimar Germany where they kept printing money and uh, they went into hyperinflation where they're taking like little barrels of money to just go buy a loaf of bread and stuff. I, so I think the photos. I, yeah, I think we're like we're in the in the probably in the middle stages of where Weimar Germany was. Not a good thing. Well, I definitely don't want to bring us down, man. We were on Romeo and Juliet's high. (laughs) (laughs) It's not talking about the future collapse of the economy all the time. But I think it is, to your point, uh, and why I mentioned it, I am on the fence with this Bitcoin, not Bitcoin, XRP, digital currency for the first time because uh, the more I actually start to look at it and realize, you know, China went to an electronic currency. This is real. It's no longer just, oh, well, it's never going to happen. I got my paper. And now I'm worried my paper's worthless. Well, I think it might be worthless. I mean, anytime you talk about paper fiat currency, you're talking about your money being worthless because it's not backed by anything. And if you really look at our Constitution, I think the founding fathers were really smart about saying like our money, our currency has to be backed by a commodity. Right. I agree. And when the money's not backed by commodity, it's what is backed upon faith. Right. Uh, it, like, do you believe that money has value? Well, if everyone decided at one point in time, they all woke up tomorrow and they believe that the dollar bill has no value. Well, guess what? Because it's not backed by a commodity. It has no value. Understood. Um, I'm going to go back to the scotch as I'm getting ready to pour myself a little bit more, by the way. Dalmore, you are making me very happy. (laughs) Um, I'm getting this as I'm nearing the end of this first pour. I'm getting this slight lemon flavor. and getting lightheaded. Yeah, right. (laughs) It's the lemon butter. It's delicious. It's that Christmas dessert. It's a fruit cake. Not everyone likes them. Nobody wants them for Christmas. Who the hell eats fruit cake, dude? (laughs) Dude. Why would you even compare this to a fruit cake? No, I'm just saying. nasty. I I like a good fruit cake, man. Uh, Do you you honestly eat fruit cakes? I don't want one for Christmas. Nobody send me one. Please do not. But yeah, I'll have a slice of fruit cake every holiday if if it's given to me. That's freaking gross, dude. It's delicious, man. Who the who the heck eats fruit cake? I mean, if this you, guy, if, hey, in the, uh, in the if you listen to our our show and you eat fruit cake, put it in the comments, please. <laughs> that w- or let or me you, know I'm not alone. Yeah, let Jesse know he's not alone. <laughs> or if you like me and you think fruit cake is disgusting, put that in the comments, right? So, uh, and uh, oh, while we're talking about comments, once again, we haven't heard anyone say this or put it into any of our comments yet. But if you have a recommendation of a, of a single malt scotch you want us to try, we will try that scotch on our very next show. 
and we will set up uh, some kind of um, uh, we'll contact you and set up a uh, possibility of you coming onto our show and doing the tasty note section with us. So I, I just want to toss that out there one more time. I love what they have done with this flavor from the sherry casks. Minus the fruit cake. <laughs> Minus the fruit cake. <laughs> <laughs> No fruitcakes in this house. All right. I want to go back to one of our previous podcasts. We touched on a subject that I can't stop thinking about. And Wait, this are we was, done with crypto? We're done with crypto for now, man. How about precious metals? We're done with precious metals? We're done with precious metals for now. Platinum, by the way, guys. Platinum. The lady wants platinum. Do not buy gold. By the time that thing hits a ring, it's less than 50% precious metal. So, <laughs> uh, But... If you can't afford platinum, just buy buy silver, thirty dollars uh, an ounce, and uh, don't don't buy the certificates. Make sure you own it outright and have the actual metal in your hand. Top Gun, we talked about Top Gun, did we? Yeah, it was it was a while back. Weeks yeah, I ago. don't. I, who wants to be freaking goose? <laughs> That's dude? the one. That's the one. Yeah, I know we talked about. We it. also I don't want to be a goose. We also talked about Maverick versus Iceman. Okay, so we did. Okay, and you're. Comment was Iceman was not a nice guy. Different word. <laughs> Did I say he was a hole? <laughs> Pretty much. So, yes, exactly. Um, I want to dissect for a minute. Think about it. Think about that movie. I think it's another great movie, not in my top 20, but another great movie. And with that, who wait, wait, is wait. The, yeah. wait, before before we do that, do you want to watch this? Yeah, let's watch it. Okay, it's the trailer. So this is the trailer for Top Gun 2, guys. There's more to come from this. Thirty plus years of service. Combat medals, citations. Only man to shoot down three enemy planes in the last forty years. Yet you can't get a promotion. You won't retire. Despite your best efforts, you refuse to die. should be at least a two-star admiral by now. Yet here you are. Captain. What is that? It's one of life's mysteries, sir. inevitable maverick you kind of set it for extinction maybe so sir but not today Your instructor is one of the finest pilots this program has ever produced. His exploits are legendary. What he has to teach you may very well mean the difference between life and death.
reputation precedes you. I have to admit, I wasn't expecting an invitation back. They're called orders, Maverick. So we just got done watching I, that one guy who looks like Goose. That guy's gonna die. Is it Goose's son? I mean, they I show a funeral. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's Goose's son, but the guy looked too much like Goose, so he's gonna die. So uh, whoever took that character, I would be like, nope. All right, let's let's go back to Iceman. Iceman, that played by Val Kilmer. Val Kilmer did an awesome job. Yeah, not as Batman, but absolutely. <laughs> he does. He sucked pilot. as Batman. <laughs> And then Maverick, Tom Cruise. Okay. Who's the better pilot? Who's the better man? Ooh, that's tough. Um, Because Iceman was by the book. Yes. So when you're talking about technical stuff, by the book, um, there's something to be said that uh, he would be the better pilot or even the better man. Um, But then, you know, that kind of goes against the American spirit, if you will, like the traditional American spirit, not, not, not like the crap that like these young kids live with today, um, where we're, and I think that's why his call sign is Maverick, right? Cause you're, you know, you gotta go, you know, we Americans traditionally were rough and rough, uh, were rugged and rough and, uh, we, uh, didn't play by the rules. And that's probably why we won the Civil War, because we didn't play by the rules. We didn't we didn't fight the warfare that they fought. Yeah, we just didn't like tea. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think it depends. Like, if you're looking at um, traditional, Amer- uh, I guess, uh, kind of like traditional American values, um, maybe Maverick is the better man that uh, thinks outside of the box, um, willing to take risks, great risks, great rewards, I think there's a lot of great characteristics to look at in his character. Um, one of the probably big flaws, which I think would happen with most people, is having a, a loss of someone close to you and having to recover from it. Whereas Iceman, uh, he's more the, uh, like I said, textbook, um, flies you know, flies the way you're supposed to fly and all that stuff. And, and so some people who are more, I guess, anal, for lack of a better word, or someone who wants someone who's more... Rigid? More rigid, yeah. <laughs> or someone who wants more, like a person that follows the rules, then they would say that uh, Iceman's a better, better person. What is a better person? So he's the better pilot and the better man. It could be depends on how you view things. I think it's all about perception. It would be interesting to see how the whole thing plays out. Um, Iceman, Val Kilmer, Iceman, definitely is textbook the better pilot. However, at the end of the day, Maverick. Is the one who saves the day. He does not win Top Gun. He doesn't get the trophy, the yeah, seat, the the accolade, the reward. Uh, but I he, think in the, the day he shows up being as the better pilot. But he, by but by textbook he wasn't the better pilot. Yeah, I, I agree. Theoretically, to me, what you're looking at, and I don't know, neither, no one's seen this movie yet except for people on the set. Um, one possibility, one thing to think about is you get all these drones, self-flying planes. We are working on self-driving cars. Um, God, how no. do you beat 
a self-flying plane, artificial intelligence. That's right. Unpredictability, creativity, something that is not textbook. And I think that's absolutely the truth if you are a textbook pilot. So here's where my challenge comes into to your statement. If you are a textbook pilot, you're predictable. So the enemy gets your textbook and they know your move. When you're unpredictable, you are dangerous. You are going to cause damage, but you're also potentially, potentially the better pilot. Not as consistent. So if consistency is in there, Iceman's the winner. He's the better pilot. Now you get to relationships, the better man, the better potentially spouse, partner, father. Which one's the better father? Well, Iceman is absolutely predictable, so you know what to expect. That's kind of boring, man. Where is the spontaneity? Um, spontaneity goes Maybe, out the door. <laughs> once again, I think it all comes down to perspective. That's true. Um, I am some people, some, TJs, so. man, you guys have struggled with this for your whole lives. What do you guys have to say? <laughs> uh, I think, I think for some women, they probably like, uh, predictable, predictable or textbook type of guy where some women probably like the unpredictableness of a, of a maverick. Absolutely. Like, uh, you know, and don't get me wrong. I don't think Maverick's like totally unpredictable. Like, I mean, he has solid values and stuff like that. He has like a, he has rules that he lives by, but it's his rules. And the, and the, the morals are there. So it's not like he's like totally unmoral. He just goes outside the box. So here's where my answer is going to lie. My answer is going to lie. If, Maverick, Tom okay. Cruise's character, Maverick, is the better pilot. Val Kilmer's character is the better man, to that exact point. Uh, from a reliability standpoint. So if you ask me, I think the better pilot, I would agree, is Maverick. Um, I do love the creativity, but that's probably because I like to go rogue. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, and I'm, rogue nation. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm only saying rogue because like uh, uh, at work, because at my, my job. My nine, to five. My nine, nine to five. My nine to five. <laughs> I'm a trainer, uh, and I was a trainer previously, and I got the uh, nickname as the Rogue Trainer because I would go outside of the box. It wasn't that I wasn't a bad trainer. I was a good trainer, but uh, they gave me the nickname Rogue because I did not follow the textbook way. So, But your results speak for themselves. The results speak for themselves. Like A lot of people loved my classes. A lot of people... Uh, they learn from me very well. Um, I think I do a very good job, but uh, I don't follow the textbook way. That's interesting. Um, very interesting. So, but the better man. Uh, better man. Um, so business-wise or whatever like that, um, definitely I think uh, by thinking outside the box, I, I'm a little bit more creative in some of my aspects of how I would approach something. So I think sometimes that gives me a, an edge, but at the same time, it makes me very vulner vulnerable. So um, if I take the same aspect, which I kind of do in my own personal life, I would not say I would be a better man. So in this case, I would not say Maverick is the better man. I would say uh, predictability, reliability um, is a much better aspect for marriage, for children, um, cause it's good to have that kind of, uh, so boring, but reliable, boring, but reliable. I would say, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I guess I would go Iceman, better husband, probably better husband, probably better father, better pilot just because of creativity and the unknown factor I give to Maverick, but that does not mean that Maverick would be the better pilot 100% of the time because of his unpredictability and his creativity, it could put him in pos in positions to where it actually make him a lesser pilot than maybe someone who's tech textbook. I concur. And you can see that in many different facets of life, not just, you know, that of a, a significant other or a parent, um, not just as a naval pilot, top gun pilot, but also... Mm -hmm. Um, as a sports figure, so whether it be a Formula One driver, Kimi Raikkonen, also known as the Iceman, or even a Tom Brady, uh, 
NFL's most loved and hated. Uh, these are people who do things their way, but also by the textbook. And the one piece where I think, you know, you see the question mark comes in is when there is the wash when Maverick is flying the plane and they're in their drill, they're in their test, um, their combat situation, and he gets into the wash and it kills his engine. That is the risk that you're talking about as a businessman, as an entrepreneur, and sometimes you win and sometimes you don't. Uh, but nobody ever becomes that billionaire, that Bill Gates, uh, that big risk, big reward. Yeah, go exactly. Big or go home. So you may do nothing, but you also may be the next uh, Amazon. You know, there's a lot to be said there. I mean, go big, go home. That's all I got to say there. All right. So we talked about Top Gun. Um, and so something we're toying with guys, gals, viewers, all of our followers and friends is uh, when this second Top Gun movie finally comes out, uh, we might try to have a little get together. So keep that on your radar. We'll let you know more. But we're excited to go see the film. We don't know where this is going, but we love the fact. I love the fact that Maverick is being ordered to come back <laughs> to work after he was really let go, right? <laughs> for being that loose cannon, for being the guy who was unpredictable and unreliable. Nonetheless, sometimes there is an art to a craft. There is. I think uh, if you are unpredictable for a long enough period of time, right, or that wild person or whatever, it's no longer like you're a wild person. It's now you've kind of uh, honed your craft, and even though you're unpredictable, there's a certain amount of predictability about your unpredictability. Being unpredictable... Interesting. Here is where we're at. Um, we both met my challenge from last week. What's your challenge for this week? Well, I haven't really thought about a challenge <laughs> for this week. I guess um, I was thinking about something. Let me uh, let me uh, ponder here for a second because I, I know I thought about something earlier and I forgot about it, but we still have some time. We probably still have like a good ten minutes left. We're good. I with all of that, let's also consider. Okay, so week one, we failed. I don't know what it was, <laughs> but we failed. No, I'm just trying to drill down through some of the scotches. So, okay, uh, you know we've had some great scotches, some not so great scotches. Uh, how would you rate some of the scotches we've tried so far? This is week six. This is fabulous. Uh, I don't know that either of us thought we'd get here when we first started. Well, you know, honestly, you know, talk about like how this podcast came to be. I've, uh, ta I've tossed around the idea of doing a podcast with, a f with multiple friends. Uh, you're the first one who pretty much jumped on board with it and, and ran with it with me. So, uh, I'm super happy about it. And I remember we we're like, well, what should we talk about? What should our podcast be about? And we're like, well, we both like scotches. Let's do a scotch hour. And it just, it just kind of came to be. Um, so if I were to kind of rank out of the six scotches we had, uh, I could tell you what the last one would be. That would be the our big five. The wee beastie. It wee was a beast. Beastie. It was a beast. Uh, not a very good beast. It was like drinking uh, smoke with razor blades. The one from Isla, not easily. <laughs> Isla, <laughs> Island of Isla. We got that. Um, uh, let's see here. Man, I'll tell you what. The, you know, the number one, like, like I said, the I Oven. know. Uh, Oban, the Oban Night's Watch was pretty darn good. The Oban I Night's Watch was really, really good. I might have to put that at number two. Okay, I'm going to agree with you. That's my number two. Uh, no, you know what? I'm going to say I'm gonna say that's my number three. McAllen 12 would be my number one. The triple cask. The triple cask. Yes. That is my number one. The Oban 12 would be my the Night's Watch. That's number, number two. two. Arbe, let's see, what was the other one? What's the other one? We had a Lagavulin. Lagavulin oh, 8. Lagavulin 8 and then the Arbe 10. I would say they both tie at number three. 
All right. The thing is, like, I, I, I know how I always tell, like, in, in these past episodes, if you listen to what I've said, like, I always say, like, Arbeg is, like, one of my favorite ones, if not my favorite. And that's mainly because I know what to expect from it. The Arbeg 10 is super consistent. It is super consistent, has great peat, has great uh, smoke, has a uh, great flavor. Not uh, hot. Not, not hot. It, it's, uh, and, the, and the price point is a little bit lower than most of these other ones that we've had. So the price point for, for what you get on a price point on that t- on that uh, ten year age um, scotch, uh, that just like I mean, if I go to a store, I'm just like just brain dead, and I just want to have a decent scotch. I always know it's like I always know what to expect from that, and that's why I like it. It's because it's solid. Um, the uh, the McCall, uh the the log of wood eight, very good, but I think the reason why I put it like maybe at three or four, is because it's no sixteen. No, it's and, not. Oh my <laughs> goodness, no, not and, even close. I've actually and, had a lot of thought about that. And uh, I think that's I think that's probably a more of a detriment to the eight, than like if I've never had the sixteen, I might rank it higher. But like when I drink the eight, I'm just like this is no sixteen. So I can't. So I just don't rank it maybe as high as maybe it probably could be on the six that we've already tried. I, how, how would you rank? I, you know, I'm pretty close to where you are. The wee beastie would definitely be. And that's last. <laughs> number and that's six. A, like that's a long. That's like that's and a far distant last because all the other ones are like I, way better. I, and it's not. You know, it's nothing against our big because it's ten is consistent and fabulous. Um. But the wee beastie would definitely be the number six out of the six we've had. The number five going backwards, and this is so weird because I love Lagavulin. I love it. The 16 is, man, we polished off a bottle of that and we have photos from your mom's wedding that I don't even remember taking, but I still have them on my phone and I'm glad I do. Um, Unbelievably great, smooth. But, you know, the number five for me right now is the Lagavulin 8. The number four is, and, and it's nothing against Ardbeg, but that's the Ardbeg 10. Uh, a consistent, great, delicious. But we've had some other fabulous scotches in there. So then the number three comes in. Oh, you know, I didn't even rank this one. I didn't even count that one. Well, this is where it gets tricky for me. So the number three comes in. I guess that would be number three, and I guess I have to put our big in, uh, <laughs> and, and in that four and five. You know, it, it is a possibility. Um, the number three for me. I don't know, man. That Night's Watch was super tasty. It was so amazing, and it's so tragic because it's done. I've been looking ever since we drank of that bottle that's gone, <laughs> and I can't find one. And I oh, yeah, I told it. you, I told you, I found it online somewhere. Let me give you that link, dude. Give me the link. I'll order it. I want it back because we're gonna start comparing the top five and really considering some of the differences. Because one of the things I love about this experience with you, Noah, um, not just the friendship and the growing with many things but is this comparison of scotch and uh highlighting what i really like in life Uh, it's like uh the different movies like pretty woman and the marrying man where julia roberts is running around with richard gear and she doesn't even know what kind of eggs she likes right we know we like scotch but what kind of scotch do we like and we're getting to know i am for sure getting to know more about that i know you were already well versed in many of that but for me to kind of finish it up, I think for my number three. What I found surprising is my top two are Highlands, where I actually preferred Isla. And I always thought I preferred Isla more. I did too. And so I'm kind of getting scared about where Lagavulin 16 is going to fall in. The scotch I love to share with my father. Um, for me, number three is going to, and I'm looking at the different scotches here, reside at. I'm going to say the McAllen. Triple cask. My number two is going to be the Dalmore. And my current number one is still going to be the Oban. That was just oh, a really? del- I think I think Oban was delicious, but I don't think it was the number one. Ah, man. Uh, it, it's tough. I, here's where the trouble lies. I can't compare it now. Uh, tomorrow, we can compare the Dalmore to the McAllen. 
but I can't find that omen and that's the struggle. But this has been absolutely delightful. This has been a very good bottle, by the way. Uh, phenomenal. Uh, I, I wish I'd made some creme brulee. I would say bottles one through three, which is, and it varies between both of us, but the Oban, uh, the uh, the Callan, and the Dalmore. I, I mean, honestly, the difference between the three, very minimal. I agree. Fully agree. Uh, a couple things I remember about all of them, and I haven't mentioned about this until I'm thinking about it. Where is this located? Oh, this is Highland, too. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> So things change, man. When we go to Scotland for one of our casts or, you know, we need to be there for at least two. And, uh, you know, Highland, Elay's. Isla. 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 Isla is going to be on the list. I absolutely want to go see uh, that. I'll go look for the uh, Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster. But I also, you know, now I, I feel like we need to go to Highland. Uh, yeah, we definitely do need to go to Highland. All right, so proper challenge, right? Still, didn't, I still don't remember what it was. I was uh, what I had originally we're planned. Gonna, we're gonna go with a gentleman's challenge. <laughs> <laughs> read, so, read, read, read. No, I will not. <laughs> well, actually, I don't really mind tossing out reading something, but um, actually, I do know what I was going to toss out. It was a book. There you go. It was oh, a book. Oh man, damn you for remembering. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want you to read the whole book. Okay. Um, it's, uh, from the book called, uh, the master key system. Have master you, key system. Have you seen, have you, do you know that I book? I do not know it at all. Have you ever heard of, uh, the movie, the secret? I have heard of it. I have never seen it. Okay. So is so it so like the book, the secret by chance? Yeah. It was like, uh, it's all kind of yeah. golden or whatever. Okay, yeah. I still do not know, but I've heard <laughs> of it. <laughs> okay. So it's called the master key system. It's a really old book. Um, I think it is chapter two in the book. I'm kind of, I don't remember exactly what chapter it's in, but I do believe, I am. it's from Charles Hanel. All right. So the master key system. So, um, there's a part in the book that talks about who you are. Okay. And I think, it's, like I said, I think it's chapter two, could be chapter three. So I don't want you to go much more than chapter two or three in the book. You can read the whole book if you want, but it really, if you do the book, honestly and truth, truthfully, the way it's meant to be done, it's like basically it's going to take you the whole year because you're only supposed to do like one chapter a week. Okay. So in chapter two or three, it's a, he asks the question, who are you? And what I'm, what I'm talking about is like he refers to like when somebody's asked that question, he says that you are not your body, right? So a lot of times people think like, oh, well, I'm this person, right? They think of the body or what they do. But those aren't it because you tell your body what to do. So you're not your body, you're not your actions of what you do. And he goes, well, if you're not your body, then are you your brain? But you're not your brain because you tell your brain what to think. So your brain tells your body what to do. Your body does whatever it does. You're not your brain because you tell your brain what to think. So who are you? And I think it's a very great question to ponder who you are. So my challenge is to read at least the first three chapters of that book, because I'm not sure which chapter it's in. It could be chapter four, too. <laughs> but I read the first three, failed, because it's number four. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, if like, whatever chapter it is, just it's stop. It's who are you. It's, it's the who are you part of it. Okay. It's, it's called, basically, you're looking at the inner I of I am. And um, once you get to that part, you could stop reading the book. Um, but I just want you to ponder, who are you? Because if you're not your body... Right, or if you're not the actions of what your body has done, and you are not your brain because you tell your brain what to think, I want you to ponder and put in the comments of who you are. Are you part of the universal consciousness? So are we just a, like a part of the universe? Or if you believe in God, are you part of the God consciousness? So because if we are not, 
our brain and we are not our body, are we part of God and that we're just like a reflection of God, but yet a reflection of each other? Um, so I just kind of want to see like what, what you think or what other people think about who they really are. Cause obviously like we tell, we can tell our brain what to think. So that's obviously we're not the brain. So I, I think it's kind of, kind of a curious to think, thing to think about, about who we are as a person. And if we, and if we're not our body and if we're not our brain, then that means we can control what we think we can control our body and what it does. So then I think that opens up to a whole lot of possibilities that we could do in the future. Mind over matter. Well, possibly. All right. Well, I take your challenge and we'll see how it views for next week. So I guess my final parting words for uh, Scott Chower this evening is that I just want everyone to do the, uh, if you can, please do the, the challenge. Put it in the comments. Uh, we are available on Spotify, Amazon Music, Podbean, YouTube, Rumble. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe to our podcast. We really would appreciate any kind of help to spread the word about our uh, about our podcast if you enjoy it. Um, and uh, with that, I just want to wish everyone a wonderful night, and uh, hopefully uh, you'll come back and revisit us next week. Jesse, what, you got any final absolutely. words? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think you're absolutely right with everything you've said. Um, take the challenge. Give us feedback. If you're out there, you want us to try a restaurant, if you're part of a restaurant, you believe in your restaurant, give us some feedback. Let us know we should try it, and we'll uh, <laughs> definitely see what we can do. Um, tonight's dinner, we enjoyed a few. Oh, yeah, we didn't talk about what we had. Oh, dinner. man, we enjoyed a few New York strips with some Brussels sprouts, some tricolored potatoes, and dun dun dun. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we actually had the Louis Martini Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, delicious wine with that. And, uh, man, never a disappointment. Mushrooms on the side. It was all good. Um, and definitely Louis Martini never disappoints. This scotch has definitely not disappointed. Um, Dalmore, you have done us well. Uh, be proud. And currently you're sitting in our top three. So we look forward to revisiting. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody, for listening to us. And uh, once again, we hope you enjoyed our broadcast. And uh, please like, share, and subscribe. And we look forward to hearing, uh, look forward to talking with you guys next week. Absolutely. Have a great night. All right, have a great night. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>